Hello, bonjour. I am indeed the big bear. <laughs> Nod your heads if you can hear me. Ah, okay. Thank you. Um, this is wonderful to be here. Uh, Cass Spade just put on a wonderful presentation about the uh, uh, language immersion, and uh, I've learned so much. And uh, you know, I, I'm a. I was raised white. You know, they taught me French, or they tried to, when I was in public school. <laughs> and I cheated a lot on my uh, on my French classes, so <laughs> I'm terrible. But this is this is opening my ears to a whole new aspect of uh, of learning language, and uh, and I'm hoping one before uh, too long. Hopefully, I can learn a few words in a, in my Ojibwe language and uh, and and uh, enjoy the community and culture more so. All right, our introduction to uh, language immersion programming continues um, with our Zoom rooms, and I see we have. Uh, several people here and perhaps you have questions, but I'll hand it over to Cass once again, if you have any more remarks or if you wanna um, perhaps uh, um, explore a little bit more from your last uh, presentation. And uh, we did have some questions and I'm sure that people would like to, uh, to have more questions uh, as we go along here. So I'll hand it over to you um, if you have any more remarks. Sure, so I'm hoping that this session we can have about 30 minutes of Zoom breakout and then come back to the main room to have any final questions that might have emerged in the Zoom breakouts or that you have from the previous session that we can have a group discussion in. Um, we're going to be talking about, or learn, uh, how do you say this? Exploring these two, two questions. I'm going to pop them in the chat right now. So these are the questions that you'll take into your breakout room. And the facilitators, we're going to take notes of it, compile the document together. And so at the end of this, we'll upload it to the platform and you'll have access to this document as well. So the first question is, are, are, what are some of the approaches your community programs have used to implement language immersion practices? With a question, is it semi-immersion or is it full immersion? So that's the first question. And the second question are, what are some approaches that have been most helpful or successful in supporting language learners and proficiency? And so we'll compile a document after with all of these tips and tricks of our collective knowledge to share with one another. And that's kind of the hope of the, the Zoom room because I am just one person in this giant room full of, I'm sure, very amazing language speakers and teachers and, you know, so that's, that's, what, that's what the goal is gonna be. So if you wanna copy this question, write it down, there's two questions and we'll, we'll go into our Zoom rooms for about 30 minutes to discuss these two questions. We'll come back to the main room to share and for any final questions and comments. And you know, please feel free to share the questions up to the group too. All right, and I see that the prompt to join the room has opened. And so feel free to head on over into your, your other Zoom room. And I'll see you back in 30 minutes at 12. Just in case, I think. I think you should still be able to see them, but put them just in case. And if you want to change your view to see everybody, if you go to the top corner, there's a little view prompt. You can click on it, hover over it, and there will be a speaker view and a gallery view. If you click gallery, you can see everyone. And uju ba da chimo. Hi. Okay. Hi. <laughs> nice to see all of you. Um, I think it's it, there's going to be about 16 of us. I see that a couple of them are the, the support staff too. So maybe we want to do a round of introductions and you can each just say, hi, my name is, um, I work here. And maybe what you're hoping to get out of the, the two-day language conference. So I'll, I'll go first, although all of you know me. So hi, I'm Cass, I'm from Mish. And 
I'm just really hoping to build broader networks of immersion. And as a young person from Northern Ontario, Nan territory who grew up here, um, just, just advocating how important the language is to me. And so if you're a teacher who is not from our territory, to please start and continue advocating for immersion in your schools too. And I'll just popcorn style. Okay, so whoever would like to go. Sure, I'll go. I'm, uh, I'm Kelly and I am in Red Lake. Uh, we have a, um, a native language program here at school. I don't teach that. <laughs> My colleague does, who wasn't able to get some extra coverage today as she's busy with volleyball stuff. But um, yeah, we, my class that I've, I'm a resource TS spec ed teacher here, and I have a small primary classroom in the mornings. And uh, we visit our um, Indian Friendship Center every week. We've connected with an elder there. So that's been very exciting for us because the kids are very, very excited to um, sit back, listen to his stories, and he's got some great stories <laughs> to share. <laughs> so we're, I'm just looking at, at ways that I can sort of incorporate more um, outside education. It's hard to get away from sort of the stuff we're used to all the time. And um, yeah, anyways, that's what I'm hoping to do. Miigwech. Okay, maybe for, for efficiency sake, I'll just, I'll just, you know, like that. <laughs> so uh, I have a Ava Tane. Hi, watch it. Uh, my name is Eva Nimatathwadlan. I live here in Constance Lake, First Nation. My family's from Fort Albany, but I grew up here with my grandparents. When I was 13, I was uh, I grew up in Quebec, so I speak two languages, Cree and uh, Quebec language. I've been at I've been working as a Cree teacher at the school for three years. The first two years was the hardest, but the third year was getting easier. The hardest part is like I'll say 80 percent, 90 percent of the population of students do not speak the language, and my language is like Cree Cree and their Oji Cree, so I'm like having a little hard time. But for this year, I'm very impressed with the students, the way I've been teaching. I've been like, I'm not following the curriculum that I was supposed to follow. I decided to do my own stuff. And they're picking up very, very fast, especially the younger grades. So I'm here, like, I'm hoping to learn more stuff, how to teach my students and all. Sorry, I'm just kind of getting nervous. <laughs> That's okay. Miigwech, miigwech. And um, anyone who feels more comfortable, please introduce yourself in the chat too. That's that's an option. Miigwech. Uh, and I see Tyler next. Uh, yeah, bonjour, man. Kubanas, makdama, egan, denigo, tik didama, bearskin, like dunji. So my name's Tyler Armstrong. I'm currently the interim. Uh, Indigenous Language Instructors Program Coordinator at Lakehead University. And there's quite a, it's a long running program that we have here. I'm fairly new to the position. Um, my understanding it's been running for about since the late seventies. And my overall goal of being here and, and being a part of this is I just wanna, <clears throat> I think uh, sometimes we get stuck in our old ways and I need to see what's out there and see how we can start to offer um, programming because uh, right now I notice that there definitely is a bit of an emergency with the, the language and how many speakers there are. And it means a lot to me. I, I'm not fluent. Um, something that I, I continue to work on and and I think it's also for me personally as well, not just from coming from uh, uh, an organization standpoint or any of that, because uh, I got a little one, I want to pass that on. Um, my mom's first language is OG, OG Cree. She grew up in Bearskin. Um, I'm currently in Thunder Bay right now. And uh, I think that's it. So I uh, just want to say me glitch to everyone as well. So. 
Miigwech. Miigwech. Uh, Lillian? Uju Kinawia, Josh Kikish Gopin Kishinikaz, Vision Dutem, Marsopska Shogam Donji, Mardish Utenang Dishikna Maki, Makinora Gajan Kartik, Mima, Mzepion Jayaka, Benunjiak, Kakna Moko, Mitash Ea, Mandijanaki, Makna Matu, me, me, and Kakna Mona, Naka Benunjiak, me, etch, chum. Chantanish Nabe Mort is a good gentleman down at the door, me and Snappy Moon, Zamke Gitasha Gibati no canyon at the door, me and Snappy Moon. Me the skinny manj bijan, he in Nanta Kendani can gego. An in Kigish Chigan, Kishak Nabagayan, me ear. Kiget gaining Nipogagundan at Kendan, he again at the Eight in Mizekum Papa Maya Kakin the months ago came in me a Kaya and me. He Papa Maya and me a Nipak no more guapin on cheek. Me the skin in Munch Bisha and me. Magshap Kanke Gunda Duck Kendan, the Quick Kendan. So I just want to introduce myself. My name is uh, William Swain. Um, I come from the Lynx clan from Grassy Narrows. But I teach in Kenora, Kenora, Ontario. And uh, I, we teach, um, our school is mainly um, uh, a language and cultural school. So our students come from the surrounding communities in Kenora here. But our, it's not immersion, it's semi-immersion, you know, half, half language and half English. And, um, but our main focus is teaching the language and the culture. And um, as I've mentioned, I, um, I'm, I'm an outdoor person myself. I love to uh, be out there, out on the land. And um, so uh, whatever I learn out there, I bring back into school and teach the, the, the students, uh, incorporating the language and uh, also the cultural, the cultural part of it. So I'm here to, to, um, to learn more, uh, like what um, another person said, like new ideas, you know, as, as you do, you know, as a language teacher, you do get stuck in your own ways of teaching. So I'm always open to learning new, new ideas, new suggestions, new programs, new resources. So that's why I'm here today. Miigwech. Miigwech, Lillian. Uh, pass it off to Martha. What um, my name is um, good morning. It's a beautiful day. My name is Martha, Martha Sutherland. My um, spirit name is um, Lightning Woman. I'm from Fort Albany First Nation. And where I come from, our language is still very much alive. And I say that because I hear about the state the language is in in some places. And I don't think we realize how strong our language is where I come from. The, a lot of the adult speakers are still strong and fluent they write in the language and also um, but I will acknowledge that our young people are starting to forget to speak the language our young parents are forgetting to speak to their children in the language so I don't like to say um, that we've lost the language 
I, I I say that we we forget to speak the language. Even those of us that are language carriers, myself included, when I speak to someone, well, my partner, for example, he's very fluent in the language too, writes in the language. And for some reason, we speak to each other in English. I don't know why we do that. It's become like a habit where even when we speak to people who are fluent, we, we tend to speak in the language. And there again is an example of forgetting to speak the language. So that's always a daily challenge for me is to remember to speak in the language when I'm speaking to someone who understands it or even to my children, even so that they can learn and pick up the language. <clears throat> my background in language as a teacher, I'm, I'm a, Lillian is my, uh, the one who just spoke earlier. We are colleagues from, um, as classroom assistants way back in the 80s in Northern, at, at, um, where is that? Canador, the Pacific University in North Bay. And um, when we met, um, we were learning as classroom assistants. And that's where um, I decided to become a teacher when I was in the classroom with a non-native teacher. She was doing her uh, her you know her lessons and I would take over as an assistant and do it all in the language that's how we were working as classroom assist assistants before and I thought to myself I, I can do this how come I, I don't know why I don't just go to school and become a teacher myself so that's where I decided to become a teacher and my background in language teaching consists of being a language teacher in my own home community and 30 minutes a day. And it didn't take long for me to realize that this, this wasn't gonna go anywhere. But I am happy to say that some students, I had some students who were quick to pick up the language, even writing the language. But the sad part was they didn't know what they were saying or writing. That's, that's, that's what I saw as a language teacher. I've only taught as a language teacher for three years out of my 21 years of uh, experience as a teacher. But I was also in a setting where um, Cree language immersion was strong. It was um, with the Cree school board in Quebec. There they have uh, children entering kindergarten in the language they teach. They, they teach in the language all day long from kindergarten to grade three and all the subjects. And that was, what my dream was, was to be able to be in a setting like that in my own language, because um, Quebec Cree is not my, um, my language that I grew up into or was born into, but that was, that's my grandmother's language on my mom's side. And, but she came to Ontario and the Ontario Cree is what I speak. And I couldn't teach in the Cree language program that they have in Quebec because I wasn't fluent in that dialect. So I, so I come from a, uh, I worked in that school for that kind of setting for three years. And it was really exciting to see that um, students could actually be taught in the language all day long in all the subjects from social studies to science and math. Everything they did was in the language. And um, that, that I, I have that experience as a um, teacher, like being able to see the students. But my job there was um, to immerse the students in the English language, which was the opposite. <laughs> but yeah, that was the experience I had in Quebec. And um, I'm very interested in, I, I commented on that in the last in your workshop in the chat or Q&A that I'd be interested in having um, or being part of a network for language immersion, networking with other teachers that are interested in working on immersion programs. Thank you. Um, I think we're just gonna sh shift our approach today. So um, my apologies if you didn't get a chance to come off mute to talk, but please type uh, a little bit about yourself in the chat because I thought this would be a great opportunity for you to see all the other speakers here and on the platform you can actually go and find their names and have conversations with them too so you can further network 
Um, so I hope I hope that's okay, just so we can touch a little bit on the, the questions that are at hand. So please feel free to use the chat. Um, and for those of you, just remember that there are people introducing themselves in the chat and talking a bit about their work. So you can meet some people that way as well. I know this is so different from our in-person days where we'd had, you know, all evening to have dinner together and hang out, but I hope that's okay. So the two questions that we are talking about today are what are some approaches your community programs have used to implement immersion? Is it semi or full? Some of you have talked about that. So maybe we'll put that question up right now and we'll generate some conversation around it. And if anyone wants to come off mute or type in the chat, please feel free to do so. And I think Lillian was talking about, uh, they have a semi-immersion program. Uh, Martha touched on uh, wanting to do the immersion. Mm -hmm. And so there are any specific approaches any of you have. Or maybe I'm curious, is it mostly like a chunk of block that's used for native language teaching where the kids get like 45 to an hour a day or is there after school programs? What do we got in the territory? Huh. Yeah, at, the school, at the school where I work at, they're just doing the regular the you know i think a lot of schools are doing this where they have 30 minute blocks <clears throat> maybe a week for some people in some cases three times a week <clears throat> that's how it looks where where i work with you what other kind of language approaches do we have out there Okay, um, I guess we can look at the next question, which is what are some approaches that have been most helpful in supporting language learners? So if, if there are any approaches that any of you use, like maybe you're doing some art making or maybe it's call and response, flashcards, storytelling. Um, I'll kind of talk a little bit about the, the stuff I'm doing in the classroom. Uh, first of all, um, our, uh, our school is from JK all the way up to high school. Uh, we have two language teachers here. I teach elementary and uh, my coworker teaches a high school. So we do have a uh, language that's happening uh, every day in the classrooms and um, and uh, our, our periods are, are pretty short though. You know, they're, uh, they're only like 30 minutes, 40 minutes max. But um, I think we need to, to like to extend, you know, the periods that we have. Uh, our staff is um, half, uh, half Anishinaabeg and half non-Anishinaabeg. So that um, that kind of so we're also not we're not only teaching uh, students we're also teaching uh, staff to to learn the language so we're kind of doing two jobs here so to me I feel uh, the periods need to be longer um, the the language teachers are fluent speakers but like I said we're also teaching. The, the staff to learn to learn the language as well, and we try to encourage the staff to uh, to use the language as much as they can, not only for the time we go into the classrooms. So uh, we created uh, what we call language bins. So every classroom has a language bin, and uh, each folder uh, has a title of whether it's seasons or the months, the days, the numbers, the animals, everything is in those language bins. So we encourage our teachers to use those language bins, you know, depending on uh, what kind of subject they're, they're teaching. So uh, we do a lot of um, encouragement 
to try and push, you know, the non the non speakers to to uh, to use the, the language bins in the classroom in the classroom. And uh, the other thing I kind of wanted to mention was um, uh, when you talk about the parents. So it's not only in the um, the school. It's not only uh, the the students shouldn't be just learning the language. It needs to be. It needs to come from at home too. And because a lot of these parents are are young parents, you know, and they're non speakers, so we need to find ways on we how we can also uh, educate these young parents, so they can, uh, you know, because a lot of our students take the the language home, and then we'll get a parent that will come to our school and say, oh my my you know my student is bringing the language home. I don't understand what they're saying. They're obviously learning the language, but I don't know it. So it's kind of like they they can't support their. Uh, their their own children at home so just trying to find ways on how we could uh also put that language out there in the homes and uh to to teach the, the young parents as well so yeah just trying to come up with all kinds of um um ideas on how we could um you know make it stronger the language uh stronger so i just wanted to share that and consistent we need to be consistent about uh, how we're teaching the language. So that's why we were ending up teaching our staff as well, like the non-speakers. So me, yeah, miigwech. Miigwech, yeah. That's a, that's a great um, topic to, to uncover is that when I worked at Wadoku Dotting, the like vast majority, I think there was one parent that actually spoke the language. They do not speak the language. And so we're teaching kindergartners how to speak in Anishinaabemowin and we're only speaking to them in that language and they would go home and do like a reverse language nest where they would bring language home to their parents and the parents would start learning with them so a lot of the homework we gave out was actually kind of the the students who are being taught to teach their parents how to start speaking too because recognizing that our children are our teachers too and we don't just teach them um, and then another program that was implemented was night classes for the parents so the parents would come in and they would be learning those vocabularies that their children were learning. And it was all about the community coming together. Um, and this was in the United States. And that's a great um, idea or maybe a great strategy to start using if you can advocate for that type of thing in your schooling. And touching on the language bins, I love that you have language bins in all your classrooms to have these like um, resources or these little gifts in each classroom. But uh, furthermore, you could also introduce the idea of um, giving thanks each morning in language so we can pass on our prayers to children. Um, so maybe there's a, a prayer that you you work with your school to create in immersion. Every morning, a new student takes over the prayer. So one student would pass tobacco to that student. <laughs> Sorry, my voice is going. Pass tobacco to that student. The student would offer the prayer and then they would go put the tobacco outside. This is something we did in the immersion school because then we're teaching our children our prayers too and we're passing on those types of ways that we give thanks and it's so easy to incorporate and then those prayers um, when they're adults they can give the thanks they can give the prayers and they, they're not disconnected from that so if you want to incorporate that alongside having your language bins Go ahead, Lorraine. Sorry, um, I just wanted to mention, uh, we do have a smudge and prayer every morning throughout the whole school. So we do, do, uh, we do that every day. We smudge every day. Uh, we do have um, an Ojibwe prayer that we do with the students also every day. So this is like a daily thing, a daily thing for the students. And um, a lot of the students here already know how to say the prayer in the language by themselves. So that's a, that's something I forgot to mention. Yeah, I, I, I love, oh, go I, ahead. That's five minutes there earlier. So I'll just um, share one uh, strategy or one approach is the total physical response approach where you do actions and then, you know, it helps them remember like minikwe, michiso, shikoho, and you know doing those actions and then um also 
the introductions part that you were mentioning, just to add to uh, another another approach to that is also teaching them to introduce themselves with their their name, spirit name, and also their parents and grandparents, and then tying that to where their grandparents originate from out on the land and learning that place where their grandparents or relatives came from. So I just wanted to add, add to that the discussion before time is up. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And another way um, at Wadoko Darling we formed the week was each Monday we start with um, big drum. So the children would walk in with big drum and we would have a formal opening ceremony of that week and just reinforcing the practice of like respecting one another, but also we gather around big drum and this might be a different practice to your community, but we would sing songs with the children. Um, the young boys would learn drumming at that age and the young ladies in that community, they would be dancing or the ego kwayuk, the third gender, whatever it may be. So we'd open up with big drum and there would be different activities throughout the week. Maybe it would be, there was a feast that week and it would be conducted all in the target language. And so maybe on Fridays, we'd have big feast day. Um, there would be like big drum day. There was storytelling day. So we'd bring in the elders to the, from the community to tell stories on Tuesdays. And furthermore, in the winter, um, part of the curriculum in the winter is that the students have to learn one of our stories and one of our traditional stories. And they'd learn it all year long. And in the winter, they would present it in the target language. So we would actually go and listen to them tell us stories during the winter months. And, you know, with our winter stories, it has to be dark. It, it needs to be nighttime. But the elders in that community, they came around and they decided to create a black room. So that's where the children would tell the stories during the daytime. So if you're like, how do you how do you work around that? That's what that community had done. Um, and yes, uh, coming back to Martha about total physical response. Lots of games, you know, playing games with kids is really wonderful. And then building the curriculum to have like culminating projects too. So maybe you're teaching them all about sewing vocabulary and you do that over a week. And then the next week you actually sew a moss bag or you sew something um, to embed that. But we have a minute left. So I'm just curious if anyone has another strategy or something that's been successful in their school. So can I, uh, any uh, cast? I just wanted to add uh, um, what you just said about, um, so I took my classes to Sugarbush and Birch Island. And uh, so I gave them a worksheet. Um, so it has words in it, like uh, the introduction. Ani um, Wenjian, where are you from? Anishina, Bamapi, Anishinaabe, Anatik, Nibi, Goon, Gunika. Ziguan, you know, words like that that would be using at the sugar bush. And so I've been implementing that with them, like every type of teaching we've been doing, the harvesting this past. Um, so I did a harvesting with them last uh, couple of days ago. Ziguan, Nika, Nuji. So. Wow. All right. Beautiful okay. faces everywhere. Mm hmm. Okay, so Jerry and I, I'm wondering if we could do a recap of just the some of the strategies that emerged out of the room, or some of the conversations about immersion and language that's been successful, what kind of programs there are. So maybe you want to give like a five minute summary around there. And I'm sure there's lots of conversation. All right, <clears throat> Miigwech. The uh, group that, uh, that I facilitated uh, came from all over uh, all over your territory, and it was awesome to uh, to uh, see so many friendly faces and, and hear the language. Uh, we had one um, uh, educator who felt more comfortable speaking in his language, and of course he did. And uh, it was uh, uh, I thank him for doing that. Um, it, it, it's just beautiful language to to listen to. And so I think what we learned was that the uh, the youth, the students. Some of them are fortunate enough to hear the language, not just from their, their grandparents, but the language has been passed down generation to generation. So they grew up listening to the language in, at home. And then when they went to school with immersion, they would hear some of the languages early as, um, 
early childhood daycare, and they would speak the language in, in, uh, in the daycare. And then through kindergarten and onward, um, they would hear the language from, from some of the schools. Uh, also, we did touch on uh, the uh, residential day school and how language was, uh, was removed from the students. You, they weren't allowed to speak it there. But the good news from this story was that once, uh, once she, uh, the, the uh, residential day school uh, kind of went away, she was invited back to teach language in, in school. So that is a, a success story. And, and uh, in, in some regard, I think, you know, they, they thought, my goodness, we, you know, everybody wants to speak the language. Are there any language speakers out there? And she was able to, uh, to, uh, to not necessarily go back, but offer her, her guidance and teaching the language to, to uh, people whose language had been uh, taken away. So I, I thought that was powerful as well. Um, a lot of people, as I mentioned, are uh, st uh, storytelling after school or evening classes. Uh, someone put together um, gatherings in the evening to meet outside the school, like outside the school hours in, a, in a, a gathering to share the language. And I thought that was important. So in other words, the people are taking it upon themselves to make sure that the language continues uh, in school, but also um, after school hours. And they invited elders and not necessarily as storytellers, although that is a huge, uh, a huge uh, part of it, but they shared, uh, they would just talk about the day's events or look at the trees or just talk in the language so that the youth could, uh, could, could hear the language. So that, I thought that was uh, something special. Also, communities are looking for language teachers that might be available everywhere. So if you have the ability to speak the language, um, you are uh, needed uh, by, your, by your school or your, your community to, uh, I guess, step up and share your language if, if you're a, a, lang a language speaker, uh, speaker. Apparently I'm not. And the dialect is different in different communities. That was brought up as well. Uh, some words uh, mean something a little bit different in different dialects. So that was, uh, that was brought up too, but it's also something that people can um, in interpret, understand and deal with. Um, so thank you to everybody who uh, shared their thoughts. We had many people and we weren't, able, weren't able to get to all of them, but uh, big chimigwitch to those of you who shared and those of you who offered uh, guidance and question. Uh, I didn't have enough time to prepare an official document. <laughs> this is this is what we have. So over to you, Cass. That's okay. I've recorded it. And so after this, we're going to um, compile it and put some more resources and strategies in it and we'll upload it to the platform so you can have access to it. So and that's for everyone. So in our group, uh, we were doing some introductions and unfortunately had to, sh had to shift to the questions. So there are lots of beautiful people to network in our group and feel free to reach out to any of them. Um, so we talked about um, some of the programming in our schools. At the moment, there are a lot of 30 to 40 minute blocks and that's kind of it for language that week. So maybe uh, thinking about the idea of extending those blocks out or creating immersion blocks as opposed to just vocabulary memorization blocks. And they talked about extending language, not only to teach their kids, their students, but they are teaching the staff that are non-speaking too. So that simultaneously teaching the students, but also staff. And perhaps there could be a strategy around inviting the staff into our classrooms with native language um, immersion programming. And there was a comment about having language bins in all of the classrooms and each bin would have a different um, category or um, curriculum in it. So seasons to days, months, and encourage students to play with these language bins to pull them out to start playing with games or um, to learn the words and vocabulary associated. It, I kind of thought of them as like little gifts to each classroom, like you could plop them in all the classrooms and the, the kids could play with them. Um, we also spoke about having a morning prayer every morning and teaching the students how to speak morning prayers in their own language and having each student give the morning prayer each day. So one of the students would grab tobacco, pass it to the student, they're speaking the prayer, they put the tobacco up for the day. And so that these students learn prayers as they grow into adults too. And so they can always give thanks. Um, one of the things we talked about too, was that we are teaching our students 
but sometimes their parents don't know the language. They're young parents, they might not have the access to it. And so working around that, talking about how our students then engage in a reverse nest, they bring home all of the learnings to bring to the nest as opposed to the nest having all of the language. So in that process, developing homework sheets that can be done with parents or programs that can be done with parents and, um, and also having night classes for parents to learn the language so that they can be using it at home with their children. And so one of the, the teachers talked about, they do a, a smudge and prayer every morning too. And we had the total physical response as one of the strategies. So just playing a lot of games and incorporating movement into it. We talked about weekly activities of having maybe big drum at the beginning of the week to bring in the students around songs and dance and carry those activities through. So there was sugar bushing, there was um, winter storytelling, there's all these different activities to include. And yeah, so, and then we have a couple of resources. So things like Flipgrid and Canva. So in the document that goes out, we'll have some of the strategies and then we'll have the resources that you can access at the bottom too, with a little bit of a briefer about them. Um, because Canva is a great strategy or a great resource to build worksheets with. And that's how I make my worksheets. And what are in the language bins? That's a good question. So maybe I can send that question to Lillian. Do you wanna to speak to the language bins just for a bit? Thank you. Bonjour again. So in the language bins, I, I was trying to type up what I was <laughs> to answer that question. So in our language bins, like I said, every class has a language bin. So in the bin, there's like folders. We created folders. So each folder has a, a topic. And in these folders are either worksheets, flashcards, workbooks, pictures, and they're all labeled in the language. So each topic, uh, an example, um, numbers. So we have numbers from one to 10, by tens up to 100. They come in flashcards, they come in worksheets, they come in uh, workbooks. So, uh, or there could be another topic of um, seasons, the four seasons. So again, we'll have pictures in there, the words, um, workbooks, worksheets. So each topic has all these activities, games, stories. So we, we encourage uh, the teachers to use these things, um, not just when I go in there for 30 minutes or 40 minutes, so we encourage the teachers to try and use these bins so they can learn as well and they can just pull them out whenever they need to. Like, you know, if, they're, uh, if they wanna teach a certain word depending on uh, their subject that they're teaching. So we try and, and encourage the teachers to, uh, to use these bins as they're uh, teaching their, their subjects as well. All right, me, me Wesleyan. <laughs> Yeah, that is a, a, I see in the chat, there are a couple other comments of how that's a great idea and supporting like other homeroom teachers too. Um, great. Yeah. And you can develop it all different types of subjects. So math, science, and it's just such a nice idea that I, I've never thought of myself. So thank you for sharing that too. Okay. So I see that we have about four to five minutes left and um, I don't, I saw in the chat before there's a question about language and the urban setting. And I will briefly talk about that, but um, there is a family that lives in Toronto surrounded by English and none of their family members speak in the but the mother decided to, to learn the language and went to Oog and went to these camps. And when she birthed her children, she only spoke the to them. And they're actually fluent. They're like way more fluent than I'll ever be. And they, their first language is Anishinaabemowin in, in the heart of Toronto, where there's so much English around them. And the ways they had done this, and it's in their resources too. So if you take a peek, you can probably find that family. But they had just created books. They taped over all the English and translated everything into it. So the kids are reading in the language. Um, there's a lot of movies and like TV shows and things like that for the kids to watch. 
she has new two kids now and they only speak Ojibwe to each other and they're very sweet. So it is possible even if you're in the urban setting too. All right. Now, I don't know if we have time for a question, but like I said, we're gonna compile this document, upload it, give you some strategies, tips, tricks for implementing immersion. And as always, keep advocating at your schools for immersion programming, do it in every, every and any kind of capacity. So whether it's just the kitchen is an immersion space, uh, we only have 40 minutes, it's gonna be full immersion. Um, and just keep building on the programming. You know, if you're out in the sugar bush, make it immersion um, and things like that. If you can have a camp on the weekends, do an immersion camp, do night classes with your, with your teachers and your adults in your communities and things like that. Um, but maybe I'll, I'll hand it off to Jerry to take us through since it's the last two minutes. So a big, big thank you to everyone for joining. And tomorrow we're gonna be doing children's games. So we're gonna be teaching a lot of different games you can play. That's terrific. Thank you so much. And uh, we're coming up, of course, uh, probably one of the most uh, um, important uh, sessions we have lunch. <laughs> I'm starving. Um, so uh, we're going to uh, we'll be uh, stopping for that as well. Some of the uh, other things that we talked about in our in our break, and it's certainly something to uh, discuss, and that was the internet. How is the internet affecting the youth and their ability to uh, to uh, communicate because they're so they're up late at night. Somebody says kids are up all night on the internet. There's no one to talk to. They're just kind of eyes on their phones and and watching. So uh, that's something too that's affecting the language. But uh, we'll leave it there for now. And uh, we'll we'll uh, thank you to all the participants here, all the delegates. It's amazing to hear uh, hear uh, what communities you're from. And uh, and thank you for sharing uh, your knowledge with us today. So we'll take a quick break. And uh, coming back up, we have uh, a youth. Uh, playlist here and uh, we're looking forward to that. So enjoy your, your lunch break and we will see you again at 12.30 here at our uh, wonderful conference for the language curriculum. I'm Jerry the Big Bear Bear, thank you. Mm -hmm.